continuing in John chapter 8, and what a chapter it's been. It's been a thrilling glance into the life of Christ. We learn a lot of things, and there's a lot of thing, a lot of thing, wonderful things that, I mean, you can just spend a lot of time, you know, in the teachings of Christ, but we move forward. Um, you know, as I, I read this last section, there was verses that came to my mind. One was, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus will tell his disciples in John chapter 15, if, the, if they hated you, it's because they hated me first. If they persecuted you, it's because they persecute you, but persecuted me. And if we're going to live and speak the truth, especially going forward from here in our time in history, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be attacks. It's going to challenge us. It's going to challenge us to the core of what we really believe, what our, really our convictions are about. Do we have any convictions? Do we know Bible doctrine well enough to stand on some of the things we've been teaching in this, in this, in this book so far, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? We will not bend from that. He came from above. He's going back above. He's coming back again. His mission was to come and to save the lost, to present the truth of who He was and offer a way of escape that people would not have to die in their sins. That's the message that we've, briefly, that we've covered, you know, so far in John chapter 8 with all the conversations that he's had and all the, the, uh, the, the uh, arguments that came from his miracles, came from people that he talked with. And we come to the last part of chapter 8, and he just finished telling the Jewish people. Now remember, these, these Jewish people were religious people. It wasn't like he went to the roughest crowd in town and attacked and, and told them the truth. Now, he wouldn't have cared to. He would have, but he was at the Feast of Tabernacles at the end of the feast. And people's leaving, so he's in the temple teaching, I am the light of the world. And people come by and they listen to him. They sit down and he tells them, ultimately, you don't believe my words you're of your father the devil. You're under the influence of the devil. We looked at that last week. And I'm, I'm surprised at the way they attacked him. Um, they didn't, we would expect repentance, examination. But instead, he got ridiculed. He got attacked. And so we pick up in John chapter 8, and I'll read verse 47. That was our last verse last week, and then we'll just follow right on through. In verse 47 of John chapter 8, it says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. And that would be a scary thing. That would be something at least we could examine ourselves about. But what did they say? Verse 40 answered, 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou, hast, that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? <laughs> Basically, they were calling him a demon-possessed Samaritan. And the reason they did that, when they called him a Samaritan, you know, we, they, we talked about this when we looked at the woman at the well, the Samaritan, you know, they were, they believe you worship in this mountain, and she said the Jews believe in this mountain. So when they called him a Samaritan, they were calling him half-breed. They were calling him um, um, a heretic because he, he taught false doctrine. Um, something's wrong with my mic. It's not this. Um, they were calling him a half-breed. They were calling him a heretic. And then when they called him Satan, the devil, thou hast a devil, they were saying, you're insane. Or they could be saying, you're under the influence of the devil. You accused us of being under the influence of the devil. You're the one that's under the influence of the devil. And this was an amazing attack on him. And, and then Jesus says in verse 49, He answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor him. Or you dishonor me. He says, I'm just honoring the father. 
you're the one that's dishonoring. When you dishonor me, you're dishonoring the Father. He says, I seek not my own glory. I didn't come to seek glory for myself, popularity, influence. He, we know he came to seek and save that which was lost. But he says, there's one, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. And he's talking about the Father. The Father's going to prove Jesus is worthy and that Jesus is worthy of glory. But it's the Father that does that. He says in verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. If we obey his words, if we believe the gospel, and we follow him and we're true disciples, you know, he promised if you, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And now he sets us free from death. And what, what is that death? It's, it's, basically, it's, we're all going to die, you know that physically. But there is no second death to the child of God. There is no, as we read in Revelation, when they're cast into the lake of fire, the Bible says this is the second death. And so they don't, they're not going to taste the full impact of death. They're not going to be crushed under unpardoned sins when they die. The sting is taken out because we have victory in Jesus Christ. And for the child of God, when we die, it's just a, we shut our eyes and we wake up in glory to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. It's that quick. And so Jesus is telling this, and this is their response because they're always thinking in the flesh. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham's dead, and the prophets. Abraham's our hero. The prophets are the proclaimers of the truth. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest, who, who makest thou thyself? Who are you? What are you doing? Who gives you this authority? And people do us the same way. Who gives you the authority to do this? Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. You, you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall, be, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. So Jesus is moving it more than just lip service. You know, in other places when he would attack the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, he'd say, you honor me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. He's saying, I not only know him personally, but I, keep his, I, keep, I do what he says. I'm not seeking glory for me. I mean, the Jewish people, that's all they saw. They wanted somebody, you know, they wanted to sit in the upper seats and they wanted to be all the, all the dressing and pomp and circumstance and everybody look at them and think they were great. Verse 56, he says, your father, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? He goes, you're not even 50 yet. It wasn't that he was 50. It was, a, it was saying, How do you, Abraham lived, what, 1,800 years before this? Long, you know, longer? How are you not even 50? But let me just turn and read you out of Hebrews. This is what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 13 of chapter 11. It said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now slip down to verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he, he, and, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, according to that God was able, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in figure. So a writer of the Hebrews gives us insight to this. He saw a figure in Isaac of an only son being sacrificed and a ram caught in a thicket. And dimly, dimly did these Old Testament, but they saw it and they believed the promises, yet they never grasped them, I mean, never got them because they died. But now here's Jesus standing in front of him, the, the fulfillment of that figure that all these Old Testament saints had saw. 
And in verse 58 he says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. I mean, there's that I am statement again. Goes, they go, and then in the Jewish mind, they would go right back to that burning bush when God says, I am Jehovah, Yahweh. However, he's the self-existent one, the creator of the heaven. And the earth. He's, I am, I'm the all-sufficient one. That's his authority. And they said, who are you? And so he explains to them, I am. Now, this is, they, that just took them over the top. Verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, that's a, I think that's another miracle right now. I mean, John just threw this in. I mean, look at it. Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. How did he hide himself? Did he do something and their eye, and they didn't recognize him, so he just walked right on through them? Did he, how did he, we don't know, John doesn't tell us, but he says whatever he did, he, it, it, this hiding myself didn't mean he went over and behind a column and hid. Or he went over and hid behind a bush. No, it says he went through the midst of them. They didn't touch him. So that's intriguing to me, even though I don't have an answer, but there was something supernatural went on right here. And it's powerful. Now, as we look at these as we look at these verses and we think about this, and, and I started out talking to you that we're going to face persecution, trials, people's going to not like us, people's going to shun us. I want us to look at this morning, how do we, how do we behave? How do we handle? When we, what do we, how do we face an attack? How do we deal with an attack against us? Do we lash back out like the Jews did? You're a devil. You're a half-breed. You're a heretic. Do we want to kill people? Is that how we face an attacker? Now I'm talking about spiritually now. I think we can look at Jesus and see how we can face an attack. Because we're going to have to face it. We've had it pretty easy in America, really. You know, because everybody was kind and and wouldn't say much about to our faces about uh, Christianity, but the devil would attack us, and so we would go through those kind of things, but when it gets people there in front of us who are of, of their fathers the devil, their father the devil, and all who they can speak are lies. We know when I hear all this stuff going on today and you watch the news, I go, they're of their father the devil. All they can do is lie. It's a lie. I don't know what else to say. And that's Jesus... Right here, he just says, you're lying. You know, you're liars. You go against the truth of the Bible, of nature. You go against the truth of nature, the way God created us. You're a liar. How do we face that? Number one, seek God's glory and not man's praise. When Jesus stood up and, 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 they, and they attacked him, they called him a Samaritan, they called him a devil. Verse 49, he says, but I honor my father, and you do, you do dishonor me. Verse 50, and I seek not my own glory. Jesus said, I'm not seeking my own glory. I'm not seeking honor for myself. And so when I'm facing an attack, our tendency in the flesh is to rise up and defend ourselves. But in the midst of that, we need to seek God's glory, because if we don't, we'll end up pleasing man. What will happen is we'll start seeking the approval of worldly people. We'll want to be accepted by worldly people. I'm afraid the church may be drifting today to where they want to be so accepted by the world. And they'll tell, stand up and say, man, I have good doctrine. Good doctrine affects the way we live. Okay, It affects the way we live. And if I'm living contrary to what good doctrine is, which some of these people say, well, at least I'm preaching the doctrine. Okay, I'm glad you are, but you're living like the devil, man. You're looking like the world. You smell like the world. You act like the world. You've got the language of the world. Uh, we're, not a seek to, we're not seeking worldly approval. I'm not setting my heart on that this morning. Jesus wasn't setting his heart on that. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. If Jesus, let me listen, if Jesus was seeking the approval of the world, 
He wouldn't have been calling people, your father's the devil. He was interested in glorifying the father. He was interested in, 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 in presenting the truth to people. But not only do we don't want to set our hearts on worldly approval, we don't want to set our hearts on religious approval. Don't try to fit in. When I remember when I first got into ministry, I did. I wanted to fit in so badly. And so, you know, I would, I would I'd call these guys. They had big churches, and I'd talk to them, and oh, I just wanted to be a part of it. But for whatever reason, and I praise God for it, he moved me to Salt Lake City. Now, we were very successful as far as worldly standards, and I hope all those people that got saved when we were in a, had our first church, I, I, I hope everything was great. But he moved me to Salt Lake City, and he just opened my eyes to a lot of this stuff. And I had to repent and say, Lord, I've been, I was trying to fit in. I wanted to, I wanted to be able to, for some of these big preachers to call me and, and, and know my name. And out there it got to where it didn't matter. You know, I was in a fight. <laughs> and you just have to live, man. You just have to make it day to day sometimes. And I just forgot about all that. And one day I woke up and I go, you know what? None of those guys ever called me. So it was me. And I said, never again. And so God taught me things that way. I had to learn. And I think a lot of times, many times, some people never learn, and they try to fit in to a group. I'm not fitting into a group. I'm going to be who God's called me to be and present the truth, and the group will fit around me. That's the way we live. Jesus came, and he just presented the truth. And at one point, he would look at his disciples and go, do you want to go away also? There's only 12 left out of 5,000 maybe. There are 5,000 left him. Maybe if it had been us, we would have been going, hey, wait a minute, how do I get those back? You know, maybe I'm riding the wrong camel. Maybe the road's not low enough. Maybe whatever it is. I've got to do something to get the crowd back. Jesus said, no, 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 you want to go? Out of here. I'm here preaching the truth. He wasn't seeking approval of the world. He wasn't seeking the approval of religious leaders. If he was, he would have never had this confrontation in the temple. Guys, let's be careful. We're not seeking popularity. We're seeking to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We're seeking to glorify the Father. That's our job. That's what we do as Christians. And if we go out and live in our communities and be who we're supposed to be, you're going to have so many opportunities in the days ahead to show yourself that I am not seeking man's approval. I am seeking the glory of God. Let's look at what Paul would write about something along these lines in Colossians. This is what Paul says about this in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 Beginning in verse 1. But now listen, we don't care what people think. You know, a lot of people say, well, we really do. Well, I, yeah, I don't want to go out and live in sin. That would bother me. But when it comes to the truth and it, how I raise my family or how I do this work, and how, I don't care. Well, listen to what Paul says in, verse, in chapter, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Jesus says, I'm not seeking glory. There's one that's going to glorify me, and that's the truth. What did, you, what did uh, Paul write in Philippians? We don't have to turn there, you know, Philippians. He's given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. There's that glory again. We're not to glorify ourselves or seek approval of man. We are to seek to glorify God. Paul would write it this way for the Christians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, listen to what Paul says. And we're going to... In just a minute, we're going to read most of that chapter under another point I have. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, verse 17, this is what Paul writes. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at things which are seen, 
but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And, as, and I just notice that phrase, you know, we think about, well, I won't, because in our human nature, but, you know, one day God's going, there's going, we're going to be in glory. Paul says here that this light affliction, and, if you, and Paul's just been talking about how all the stuff he's been through. He says, which is hid for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And this goes right with what he wrote in Colossians. That's the reason we can set our affections on things above and not on the earth. There's glory in front of us. This stuff is temporal. It's passing away. I mean, you know, it's like I said, there's people that will call you today and then they might not speak to you again the rest of your life. It, it separates. We go back to the devil lying and suggesting and we believe it. I'm mean, Just like the Jews when they told Jesus... The devil probably whispered in their ear, he's a Samaritan. He's on my side. And so, you're a Samaritan. You're demon-possessed. You know? Where does those suggestions come from? The father of all lies. And so, the first thing we do is we seek God's glory when you're facing that. And so, if we do that, that may help us be calm like Jesus. If I'm seeking to, to honor myself, then I'm ready to pick up stones too I'm ready to fight but if I'm seeking to glorify the Father I want to be like Jesus hey guys I'm not here to please you this is about God it's not about Abraham it's not about your religious her heritage whether you don't you might even not have a religious heritage it's not about you this is about God you either believe it or you don't so Jesus sought God's glory and not man's praise but then there's another thing here look let's go on in verse 51 he says verily verily I say unto you if a man keep my saying he shall never see death I want us to think about this when we face an attack not only should we not should we seek God's glory and not man's approval but we should continue living and speaking the truth Jesus said in another, just a few verses up, if, if you're my disciple, you'll continue in my word. Jesus says here, if a man keep my sayings, if a man continues, obeys, and lives in my word. And that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus said, I'm just honoring him. Verse 54, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is God. Jesus just was doing what the Father said. And that's what we need to do. Regardless of what people around us think, regardless of what our culture is, we just need to keep living and teaching or speaking the truth. Now, we need to do it in love. We don't need to hammer people over the head with it. But, you know, just as Satan is a voice in somebody's ear, we can be a voice. Think about this. What if you, there's somebody you really care about and you want them to come to church? You want them to get right with God? It, you beat him over the head, that's not going to work. I think Jesus is perfect here. He says, he was just a voice, you know. And that's what I try to be. People I know, maybe it's not as faithful as I'd like. I go, you know what, you need to be more faithful. That's all I say, and I just move on. Or you need to be in church. That voice. I, we can be that voice just like Christ was, just like the devil is with his children. We always have a voice in our ears. We always have a voice that we're hearing. We're either hearing the truth of the word of God or we're hearing the lies of Satan. And so it's, hey, I know I've heard people say, hey, if you keep it up, you drive them away. <laughs> you know what? Jesus didn't seem to be concerned about driving them away. He was concerned about glorifying the Father and speaking the truth. That should be our concern, glorify the Father and speaking the truth. You don't drive a dead person any farther away. You know, some parents would, you know, when I was a pastor, I heard this so many times. Well, I just can't make my kids go to school because, you know what, so-and-so told me that they're not in church because their parents made them go to school. And I go, you know what, that's a lie of the devil. That's not the truth. They don't go to church because they don't want to, and they, got, they found a good excuse to hang their hat on. Let's teach our children what they need to know. Let's teach them. And they, you say, you're, dri you're not driving anybody away. They'll hear the truth. We've got to continue speaking the truth. Go to 2 Corinthians again, if you would, please. Chapter 4. 
this is a this is a wonderful chapter in Second Corinthians dealing with what we're dealing with here, what, how Paul faced this stuff in his own ministry and how he just kept speaking the truth and how he kept living the truth. And, and we need to be the same way. If we're not, we're going to seek the approval of man. Let's begin reading in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I mean, do you get that verse? I mean, just what I'm talking about speaking the truth. He says, we didn't do this with hidden things of dishonesty. We weren't trying to trick people into believing in Christ. You can't trick people to believe the truth. You can't massage them to believe the truth. A lot of our churches, I mean, I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, they're just trying their best to just make it so easy and soft. And that's dishonesty is what it is. And not walking in craftiness. <laughs> I like that. That means he didn't, you know, Paul just plainly spoke the truth. He said, I don't want to know nothing about but Jesus and him crucified. That's all we speak in the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing crafting. We don't have to be cute in the pulpit. We don't have to be clever. You don't have to be when you're talking to somebody about the truth. Just tell them the truth in love. Let them know you love them and then tell them the truth. You don't have to be crafty. You don't have to be what cool. I don't know what you have to be. I mean, some of this stuff just makes me sick today. I go, man, just preach the truth. You don't have to just... Anyway, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Jesus is the light of the world. Here's, Jesus, here's Paul's talking about. Here he is again, the light, of the light of the world. He shines unto them. But Satan has blinded their minds. How is that mind going to have light? It only is if we speak the truth. Only if we speak the truth about Jesus Christ. That's, that's what, exactly what Paul's saying. That the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. We've got to speak it. And when we speak it, we got to realize there might, we might face attacks. Because somebody's going to get stirred up. The devil's going to whisper in their ear or something. And they're going to believe it. And they might, and then, like I said last week, they might start telling other people. Or they might, the devil will whisper in their ear some false, oh, I just, had a, I just had a revelation. That's not what that verse means. It means this. Listen, guys, we live in a dangerous age when it comes to interpretation of Scripture. When everybody says, well, this is what it means to me. I don't care what it means to you. What, did it, what was the original intent of the author? That's the meaning of Scripture. Once I get that, then I can say, how does that apply to me? But most people sitting around, if you ask them, they go, well, that means, that's, well, this is what it means to me. Well, give me the context here. What's the doctrine in this passage? I, I just feel it's this way. Oh, it's dangerous. Let's be careful of our, let me use a big word, hermeneutics. we got to get the original intent of what the author said. Then I can say, this applies to me here. Then there is authority. Then there's power. Then we walk in the Spirit. But not until our churches are weak today because we do what we feel instead of what we know. Speak the truth. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and our ser ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't it amazing this chapter just basically goes with <laughs> John chapter 8? He's saying the same things, but he's saying it as a man, not as the Son of God. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. What is he saying? We're going to be, basically what he's saying is I'm going to be obedient to Christ. And as I'm obedient to Christ, we keep speaking and living the truth, then Jesus is glorified. People see uh, uh, that Jesus might be made manifest in our flesh. That's how we handle conflicts. Look at Paul, all those things he's been through, persecuted, all these things. But yet he says, we still go about that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in us. So then, verse 12, death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith according as he's written. I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by... Jesus and shall present us with you. There's that resurrection, not tasting death. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many, uh, redound to the glory of God. There he is. He's, he's going back and forth, and I just put it in sequence here. He was for the glory of God, and he was speaking the truth and living the truth that the that the life of Jesus might be manifest through them. That's what Jesus did. He just stood up in this, in this group of people and just preached the truth. And they said, this is who I am. This is the truth. This is what the Father gave me to do. I'm here to honor him. I'm here to glorify him. Guys, let's really, when the attacks come, and whether it's an attack from the devil whispering in the ear going, man, if you tell, some, if you tell so-and-so the truth, they'll never like you again. Or if, if, I, if, if I teach this, nobody will ever... The devil tells you those lies to keep you from glorifying God, speaking and living the truth. That's one of the devil's powerful weapons is accusations, attacks, verbal attacks, name-calling. And Jesus said, you can call me a devil if you want to. Do what you want and call me a heretic if you want to, but this is the truth. That's what we have to, that's what we're facing today. And, and, and the sad thing about it, he's dealing with religious people. Religious people. And there might be some religious people today, we just have to look in the eye and go, this is the truth. And they'll go, oh, but look at all that I have and the, the campuses that I have and Maybe the multiple campuses I have, and I, I go, I, I, I'm glad, glad you can gather a crowd. I'm glad you can tell everybody how to raise children, but how many people are you telling how to be saved? When are you preaching the glorious gospel, the, the, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that the light of God can shine into people's hearts and open up people's eyes that have been blinded by Satan? We're in a spiritual attack today, and people seem like they're focusing on everything but Jesus Christ. And that's the answer. And a lot of these people, and I'm not a judge, and I'll never judge anybody. I can never tell anybody that they're saved, and I can never tell anybody that they're lost. But... In my mind, I know the Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. I know that. So there's a broad way over here that a lot of people who think they're on the narrow way are on the broad way. And maybe some people we listen to on the radios and TVs. I don't know. I don't know. But the, what is the dividing, what is the deciding factor in this is the truth of Jesus Christ. And are they glorifying God? That's how we handle it. And that's what we're dealing with. This is a serious matter right here. To me, in, our cult, in, our, in America right now. And it's a battle for the truth of who is Jesus Christ. Is he the son of God? And you go, oh, come on, preacher. No, no, I'm telling you. We've had a generation of feel good and telling people what it, I, it means to me. Uh, 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 sermons and lessons that we've, we've gotten away from the doctrine of Christ. 
We say him on our lips. Hey, these people's talking about God. They had a lot of ideas about God, uh, God, but they had no idea. They had a lot of ideas about God, but they had no idea who God was. And Jesus called him out on it. He says, you think he's your father. You're dishonoring me. And he's the one who sent me. Guys, we got to continue to live and speak the truth. Let's speak it in love. But let's not back down. This is who Christ is. You have to be saved. There is a hell. There is no other way. <laughs> the third way we face an attack. Let's go to 58, verse 58. Back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. What was Jesus saying? That's my authority. I'm God. So not only are we to glorify God in our attacks or attacks against us, speak the truth, but we're to stand in the authority of Jesus Christ. The authority I have does not come from me. It doesn't come from any of us. None. It comes from I am. Jesus said, when you go into all the world, lo, I am with you always. Now, to, be un to, be to stand in his authority, we've got to be under his authority. You know, we can't just never obey God and then just go out and act like we've got all the authority of God with us. No, 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 no. To be a person of authority, I've got to be under authority. And I'm under the authority of Jesus Christ, so I go out in the authority of Jesus Christ. That means we're not perfect by no stretch of the imagination. I mean, you could come up and say, well, you want to me, and I'll, I'll probably I'll agree with you. I, I'm that way. Help me. Pray for me. I, I never pretend to be perfect, but we strive. And God honors that, seeking to obey as best we can. And when we fall under his authority, we go out in his authority. When I fight a battle, I'm going to get scared if I'm really, because inside we know when I'm going up against somebody. Or somebody, or the devil is attacking. You get, we get scared. But if we think about whose authority we're in, we're under. We go, okay, this is in God's hands. That's where the power of that statement comes from. Is his authority. And so when we're fighting that, when we're, when we're facing an attack, whether it be a spiritual battle in our hearts and Satan's whispering in our ears causing doubts and, and, and depression and frustrations and discouragement and just see, 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 we get in there, we, we, I know I'm obeying God. I'm under his authority. He said all power is given unto him in heaven and earth. I'm going to trust that what he's doing now is in his purpose. And so this attack that's coming, he's given me an opportunity to glorify him, to speak the truth, and for him to show his authority through my life. It's what Jesus did in front of those religious leaders. His authority <laughs> flowed through them, through, through him. That's the reason they got so mad. Because they felt that I am. And when he said that, it was maybe like a lightning bolt went into their heart. And they didn't like it because he revealed and exposed to them that God was not their father. They were influenced by something else. And he makes me so mad. we got to shut him up. And they did everything they could to shut him up. They thought they did when they crucified him. But he just got louder when that happened. Because three days later, they couldn't handle an empty tomb. Now, 2,000 years later... You got some bonehead like me down here yelling about it. Same message that he preached 2,000 years ago. It got louder when, he, when they crucified him. And so we stand in the authority of Christ. And so if I go in, I can be, we can be bold as lines. The Holy Spirit will give us boldness. And we can speak the truth and glorify the Lord in all of it. And we don't have to call people names. We don't have to attack their characters. We don't have to do anything. We just speak the truth and the Holy Spirit just, ooh. Oh, yeah. They can easily, you know, if people 
at church and go, well, I'll never go back there. Or if they're watching on some kind of social media thing, oh, I can turn him off and never go back to that channel again. But they never, they never get away from that voice. Think about that. When we speak the truth, the Holy Spirit has ways of bringing that voice back up. That's happened in my life. I remember when I was in um, college and seminary. And when I was in seminary, I used to go, every, every time Dr. Robertson was in town, he was pastor of Highland Park and all that, I would try to go see him every week. Just two or three minutes, I just want to talk to him. You know, you know, one of the largest churches in the world. And, and he was the friendliest guy I ever was. I mean, you'd think, I mean, he's just a good old guy. And, and, but I would talk to him, and he would always, at the end of our conversation, he'd go, Mark, have faith in God. And you know what, I, I just, okay, thanks. Never thought much of it, you know. But boy, when I was in Salt Lake City, I heard that voice so much. Mark, have faith in God. When we go in the authority of Christ, the Holy Spirit takes the truth that we speak, that glorifies the Lord, and he can bring that back to, he can bring that to a lost person, and they can be somewhere, and all of a sudden, you need to know Jesus is saved. How important it is for us to do these things as long as we do it under the authority of Christ. Under the authority of Christ. Look at that last verse. Then they took up stones to cast at him. The chapter started out with stones. They wanted to stone the adulterer. Adulteress, I mean. Jesus stoops down. Writes on the ground. Who knows what? And he looks up and they're gone. Here, they bend down to pick up stones. And they look up and he's gone. They'd, when, the moment they reached to get a stone, Jesus knew their decision. They decided he wasn't who he said he was. It's a scary place to be. There's a time when Jesus will keep us from throwing stones. But then there's a time when he says, that's enough stones you'll cast. And they became, their heart became stony. Some of these people may be in this temple area right now. Will be there when they crucify him. And they're going to be chanting, crucify him, crucify him. Because they crossed a point. It was a defining moment in their life when they reached over to get those stones. Jesus said, nah, I'm moving on. I've got to go somewhere else now. We never want Jesus to do us, do, that, do us that way. And as we think about this last verse, it has nothing really to do with the conflict other than what the conflict goes on in people's hearts when they hear the truth. You've heard the truth. You've heard the truth of the gospel every time you come here. You hear it in every service. You hear it. People listen to it. Somewhere. No, you're not going to throw a stone through your TV or iPhone. Or you're not going to throw stones literally in here. But somewhere you'll throw a stone and you'll never come back. Somewhere you'll throw a stone and the stone will be you'll turn it off and go, I'm never watching that again. And Jesus will know at that moment you've made the decision to die in your sins, to feel the full weight of death that can possibly be felt other than by Jesus Christ on the cross. What's your decision today? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you believe that he's the only begotten Son of God, that he was God in the flesh, that he was truly 100% God, 100% man, that I'm in, living in sin without Christ and he came to tell me the truth and expose my sin, expose my false security, expose my ideas about God and present to me tr the truth about God. That's what the Bible does for us and praise God for the Bible. But today, we can make a decision.
Maybe you here, you know Jesus as your Savior. Make a decision to live for him. Some might be listening that's never trusted Christ. They're living in false security. You listen, you know what? These guys, they bent over to pick up the stones. But that was a decision they made. And there might be a lot of people just, hey, I can't stand to listen to that stuff. That's awful stuff. He made a decision. He made a decision. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for encouraging us. Lord, thank you for this wonderful truth. Jesus shows us how he stood in the face of an attack. More serious than maybe any of us has ever faced with people wanting to kill us, but he wanted to glorify you. He wanted to speak the truth. And he revealed his authority. I am. Help us to go out and live with these truths, guiding us in every attack, whether it's a private attack in the heart or whether it's a verbal attack toward us. Let's help us apply these things that we've learned today. Bless in the next hour, Father. Be with the pastor. Anoint him. Use him, Father, for your honor and glory. And we praise you for everything you do in Jesus' name. Amen.